and uh, good afternoon, uh, good evening, uh, afternoon in the West Coast, and good evening of the West Coast, and also good morning on the China side. Uh, welcome to this uh, special webinar on COVID-19 uh, COVID uh, um, relief, and we have the title of United, We Can Win the War Against COVID-19. And today, we are going to have uh, three distinguished uh, speakers from China, Dr. Yuan Li Liu. Uh, he's the Dean of the Peking Union Medical College School of Public Health, and also uh, uh, the board member of the US-China Health Summit. And also we're going to have Yasheng Huang, whose picture is on the poster. Uh, he is a professor at MIT Sloan School of Management. And the third speaker will be uh, 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 Dr. William Hasseltine. Uh, he's the chairman of the US-China Health Summit and also the funding uh, chair of Access Health International. And first we ha we'll have the three distinguished speakers to uh, give us a brief um, uh, report and thoughts of the pandemic, uh, first in China and in the United States. And, and around the world. And the second part, we're going to have a round table uh, uh, discussion among uh, our partners uh, from the West Coast and East Coast. So just give you this timeline. Uh, the Wuhan uh, outbreak started uh, by January and uh, later January uh, and, uh, and, and you see the date, January 23rd, uh, Wuhan uh, was uh, shut down. And after about three months, and now China is um, pretty much under the control, although Dr. Yuan Li Liu will give you a much uh, more updated uh, report on what's going on there. And then uh, come to United States, starting from the uh, March 13 uh, up to today is about more than, a little bit more than uh, one month. And you can see the surge of the new cases as well as deaths. And, and uh, uh, Bill Hasseltai and Ya Sheng Huang will give you a uh, update on that part. And then we'll have a discussion about how we can collectively uh, address the effort. So first of all, let me give you a little bit of background about what's the US-China House Summit. Uh, actually, uh, back to the history of this uh, uh, journey, uh, starting to uh, from 2005, and it's uh, already more than 10 years. And, and it started actually from uh, uh, the summit was born after SARS uh, more than 17 years ago. And uh, after SARS, uh, Dr. Yuan Li Liu uh, then was a faculty at the School of Public Health of uh, Harvard uh, University. Um, and um, uh, together uh, with uh, friends and leaders uh, uh, between uh, the School of Public Health of Harvard, uh, Barry Bloom, and also our friends uh, in uh, the uh, Ministry of Health of China, and uh, established this China initiative. And then over the past 10 years, uh, this uh, program had uh, trained more than 700 uh, leaders from China. And after that, in 2013, Dr. Yuan Li Liu went back to China to serve as the Dean of School of Health at Peking Union Medical College. And then we established this US-China Health Summit uh, as an NGO uh, registered in Massachusetts. And um, this, uh, the annual summit has been going on uh, over the past 10 years. And um, we welcome everyone, pay attention to, and hopefully join our uh, the 10th summit in China in the future. So now I would turn the podium to Dr. Yuan Li Liu. Okay. Can you hear me clearly, huh? Mm -hmm. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, greetings from Beijing. As the founder of the US China Health Summit, I'd like to start by mentioning an uh, interesting but humbling fact that we held our ninth annual summit early November, actually in Wuhan, the very city which unbeknownst to any of us at the time would become the epicenter of a new epidemic 
in just two short months. Now, in responding to the unprecedented pandemic challenges, China has taken in the past three months unprecedented actions, and in the process learned three major lessons, which I now like to share with you. Lesson number one, the COVID-19 is a very infectious and complicated disease. With the original host jumping from animal to human remaining still unknown. You know, Bill and I talked about this before this broadcast. The clinical manifestation of atypical pneumonia of unknown causes was first found among some patients in the month of December last year in Wuhan. Just like the first clinical cases of the last H1N1 pandemic was first found in the United States. Now, unlike the SARS episode Jean mentioned earlier, where it took China more than three months to be able to identify the pathogen, this time around, within two weeks, after uh, the National Health Authority was alerted, China CDC and three other national laboratories, including the one at uh, my uh, Chinese Academy of Medical Sciences, were able to identify the novel coronavirus. And the information on the complete C uh, gene sequence was shared with the world on January 10th. By now, Many people, including lay people, knows what R not, R zero, equals to three means. This basic reproduction index indicates how many other persons and for tour will be able to infect without any intervention. So if we let the virus run its natural course, it would only take 21 days for all the people on this planet to get infected. That is how infectious COVID-19 is. That's also why providing the frontline health workers with adequate personal protection equipment must be the top priority anywhere and everywhere. Now, we also know that COVID-19, the virus is affects multiple organs and multiple systems. And the disease severity and uh, mortality are closely related to the underlying diseases such as cardiovascular diseases, cancer, diabetes, and hypertension, so on and so forth. Further complicating the matter uh, are the uh, several unknowns, including how many asymptomatic carriers out there, how long the immunity of the recovered patients will last. Based, you know, largely uh, data from Wuhan, which was just uh, updated yesterday, the case fatality rate is now estimated at 7.6%, an increase by 2.5 percentage points. This important latest finding indicates that if you want to adopt a mitigation only strategy where the so-called herd immunity might be allowed to develop, the human cost in terms, in terms of death toll will be enormous. So in the absence of vaccines and effective antiviral uh, drugs, a combination of suppression and mitigation strategies become necessary to bring the crisis under control. Lesson number two, social distancing really works. The traditional public health measures for controlling infectious diseases mainly include isolation and quarantine. Now, these things are often easier said than done especially at the early stage of the epidemic. So on January 23rd, for the first time in human history of anti-epidemics, a mega city such as Wuhan with 11 million residents 
was locked down. The most extreme form of social distancing. When the strict lockdown policy was being implemented, many people started questioning the necessity of doing so by China. Because after all, the confirmed cases at the time in Wuhan was only a little over 400. And we have yet to understand the transmission power of this new virus. But Wuhan lockdown turned out to be the most visionary and courageous decision in this fight against the new pandemic, not only in China, but in the world at large. So uh, if we did not lock down the epicenter, the first epicenter of the pandemic, the next day is the Lunar New Year's Eve. The, you can imagine the population flow and the subsequent further spreading of diseases would have disastrous consequences. So China made a decisive decision at the moment of history. And uh, give you a number, give you an idea how important this lockdown policy turned out to be. Out of the total 82,000 confirmed cases today in China, 63% were found and treated in Wuhan. According to the research studies published in the international peer reviewed journals, the Wuhan lockdown helped avert millions of infections and hundreds of thousands of deaths. Uh, in large part, drawing data from Wuhan, the Imperial College London team estimated that combining home isolation of suspect cases and home quarantine of the people living in the same household, social distancing of the elderly and others at the most risk of severe diseases might reduce the peak healthcare demand by two thirds and death by half. So the whole world really owes a debt of gratitude to Wuhan because 11 million residents there and hundreds of thousands of people rushed there to help had made tremendous sacrifices during the lockdown. Okay. Now, when, the, when Wuhan reopened, okay, more than 60,000 COVID-19 patients were already treated and recovered. Lesson number three, solidarity is essential. Infectious diseases do not respect regional or national boundaries. So we really are in this together hoping others, especially the emerging epicenters of the pandemic, is helping ourselves. Because no one can do it alone. And uh, because the outbreak comes in waves, the New York State Governor Cuomo called for a rolling deployment strategy. That was exactly what China has done and done early and well. You see, soon after the Wuhan lockdown, with vigorous testing and tracing of contacts by over 1,800 epidemiological teams with five persons each, the confirmed cases in Wuhan just skyrocketed, overwhelming the local healthcare facility. So the central government sent in more than 300 medical teams with more than 42,000 doctors and nurses to help. And China also created a budding system where 19 provinces would take care of uh, each one of the 16 prefectures in addition to Wuhan of Hubei province. So and in addition, 16 temporary hospitals were built within weeks 
to admit all the patients with mild and normal conditions so that on one hand, these patients would not be given a chance to spread viruses in their homes and communities. And on the other hand, if any of them became severely ill, they can be tr quickly transferred to the designated hospitals well equipped with intensive care units. So like I suggested earlier, when Wuhan reopened, we already treated locally more than 30, uh, 60,000 patients. And this kind of achievements would not have been possible without a nationally coordinated strategy, national mobilization resources, getting all kinds of help uh, nationally and internationally. Now I believe the same spirit of solidarity is needed in the United States, the new epicenter of the pandemic, as well at the global level. You see the whole world is now under attack by a common and invisible enemy called the coronavirus. So this is not the time for any pride and prejudice. This is high time for creating a global alliance. So collective learning and collaboration is the best weapon and perhaps the only weapon we have now to fight this special world war. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yuan Li Liu, uh, to give us a very up-to-date historical review and also up-to-date uh, uh, report from China. And next speaker will be Dr. Ya Sheng Huang. Uh, ya Sheng Huang, can you show your face, please? Yeah, I think it's so, there, right? I don't see it. Can anybody see it? I Hello? My video is on, so. so. Yeah, I can see it. I can see Dr. Huang's uh, face. Yeah, yeah. Okay, just continue, we see you. Okay, okay. So yeah, let's, uh, let's, let's continue. So Dr. Ya Sun Huang is a professor, as I mentioned, professor uh, from Harvard, uh, uh, from MIT uh, Sloan School of Management. And he really had uh, been a, a, a driving force of um, the technology, technology. Uh, the use of technology and, and also um, uh, uh, community help uh, on, on this uh, uh, pandemic of uh, coronavirus. And he's also um, the, the drivers of this, uh, uh, hopefully, uh, the, the collective effort of uh, between West and East Coast. So Dr. Huang, please. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Jing. And this is a great honor and um, pleasure for me to uh, participate in this uh, discussion. Let me uh, take um, uh, take a number of points from Yuan Li's very good comments, and then um, and argue that uh, yes, there are lessons from China, as Yuan Li pointed out. But it is also important for us to remember there are not many countries in the world that can replicate what the Chinese government did. Um, we just have to be realistic and honest in recognizing that there are political differences, cultural differences, social differences that prevent a full replication of the Chinese uh, treatment program in other countries. So for other countries to fight COVID-19, there are lessons that they should learn from the Chinese experience. Uh, that's, that's absolutely true. For example, at the, at the treatment level, the medical knowledge, the treatment protocol, things like that. Um, definitely there are lessons uh, to be drawn, but it is also important to uh, come up with solutions that are also feasible politically, uh, socially, and administratively. US is a democracy and it is very difficult, possibly impossible for the US simply to proceed to impose the total lockdown on a city of 10 million people, 11 million people. So 
each country has to do what is feasible and each country has to be smart uh, about about its um, its uh, its um, uh, its solution. So I I I want to argue that there are lessons that are important and valuable from not just from China actually from also from uh, other East Asian societies. South Korea has done a very good job. Uh, Hong Kong has also done a pretty good job. Singapore has done a pretty good job. Taiwan has done a pretty good job. I think for the United States, it's probably easier for the United States to look at South Korea, to look at Germany, to look at Israel, uh, to learn what they have done. Um, and I, I'm not saying that the Chinese solution is not valuable. It's just that given the political differences, it's really hard to replicate the model. I think one lesson from East Asia, apart from the ability of the governmental system and administrative system to impose such a large scale uh, lockdown, uh, the other lesson is technology. And I think Asian societies have been smarter about and quicker about using technology, uh, contact tracing uh, app uh, was was uh, used very early on, and it was able to distinguish at a very granular uh, level between those who are infected and those who are healthy. And then there's also data integration across different domains. So you can actually provide validation of the self-reported data. And uh, uh, it is also timely, uh, able to provide to the government, to the hospitals, to the healthcare professionals with the information uh, and data in real time. I think that's one area uh, other countries should learn from East Asia. But even there, it's not that easy. Uh, and, and, and mainly because of the cultural differences between the West and the East. The privacy concern is stronger uh, in the Western countries, in Western democracies. So MIT, for example, is uh, developing apps that are protective of privacy concerns um, but the adoption is, um, so there are two key differences. One is that there's more concern about privacy in terms of the technology that you develop. And the other concern, uh, and the other aspect, not so much concern, the other aspect is the nature of the relationship between government and business. In China, the relationship is very close. The government sometimes can outsource some of these policy functions to the business. In the United States, that's very, very difficult. Um, government may adopt business solutions, but it is hard for the government to use business as a platform to carry out its public policy functions. So there are difficulties in even replicating the technology solutions from East Asia to the United States. But there, I'm going to venture to say that for people living in the United States, I think we ought to think hard about the trade-off between privacy and public safety in the moment of a public health emergency. That trade-off is not very sharp during the normal times, but it is critically sharp during a emergency situation. There are people in the United States who take as absolute value uh, the privacy concern. You know, I, I grew up in China, I was born in China, maybe I don't have the same level of concern about privacy as my American friends, but I understand completely why they are concerned about privacy. But the simple reality is that we make trade-off decisions 
all the time. We sacrifice privacy uh, in exchange for convenience. We sacrifice privacy at the airport in exchange for safety. So I don't think it's very helpful to have a purely ideological conversation about the absolute value of privacy. Privacy, maybe this is not the right way to think about it, has a price. And if the price is very high, then, um, then, then you have to be willing to pay for it in terms of other things. So I do believe after the, uh, this crisis is over, a, the moment has come for Western societies to really think hard about how much privacy I'm willing to give up in exchange for other values, one of which is uh, safety. And, and I'm not sure there's a solution, I'm not sure there's an answer, but I think we ought to start that conversation now. Because in the current state of the technology, maybe in the future, there will be magical solutions that solve both public uh, safety challenge and privacy challenge simultaneously. In the current situation, I just don't see how you can preserve both. The last point I want to make is about the relationship between China and the United States. I very much agree with Yuan, uh, Yuan Li that this is the moment for more collaboration rather than less collaboration. For better or worse, the two countries need each other in this uh, uh, emergency situation. China now has the knowledge. It also has some technology. It has the PPEs. It has the ventilators. Now in the United States, there is a political sentiment blaming the failure of the current administration on China. The argument is that the Chinese data are not accurate. There's lack of transparency. I think that's a separate issue. My own view is that there are legitimate concerns about Chinese data. There are legitimate concerns about Chinese transparency. But I don't think you can logically conclude those issues have been affecting the poor policy implementation in the United States. The reason is very simple. South Korea, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Japan, Singapore, Israel, Germany, they all acted on the same Chinese information as the United States. And they have done a pretty good job in controlling COVID-19. You cannot possibly have an argument to say that the lack of effectiveness in the United States is because of the Chinese information problem. Whether or not there is a Chinese information problem, that's a separate debate. We should separate these two issues. Lastly, let me conclude by saying that as individuals, I've been working with Jing, I've been working with the new friends, uh, Chuck and, and, and Megan and, and, and others in the West Coast. As individuals, you know, we also need to think about our own responsibilities, our own role in this COVID-19 crisis. I'm an academic, my natural habit is to write, is to do research, but I'm also a human being, also a citizen, also a member of the community. I think as individuals, we should also make contributions toward dealing with this uh, crisis. All of us can help and, and we hope that we have, um, uh, we're going to, uh, uh, we're going to uh, unite uh, against this uh, common threat to our society. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Huang. That's a wonderful uh, uh, several points uh, made uh, addressing the, uh, the challenges uh, in the current um, uh, fighting against uh, COVID-19 in the United States. And our next speaker is uh, Dr. William Hasseltine, who is sitting in New York City. So uh, we would like to see what his point of view uh, locally and globally. So now, uh, Bill. Okay, you can take off this, uh, your slide, and we can just see the screen. Oh, okay. Close the slide. Yeah. 
I will stop sharing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. All right. Um, I see you very well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the um, first of all, it's been a privilege to listen to Wan Li and Yashang. Uh, it's been an extremely interesting uh, series of uh, presentations. Let me reflect on a couple of issues that they raised before going into some points I'd like to make. The first question we are asking in America and other countries is why are we different from China? Why is the epicenter now in the United States? Why do we account for maybe one third of the total world infections? Uh, why are there more deaths in America than in any other country? When we have such a well-developed public health service, we have fine universities and very dedicated people, as uh, I'm sure Wan Lee and you and everybody recognize. There's one outstanding fact, and that is we were never hit by SARS. Mm -hmm. The countries that responded well were hit by SARS. They know what the human data damage is, but more than the human data damage, they know what the economic damage was. And I believe political people respond to economic damage far more seriously than they do to human damage. So that the Chinese government, the Korean government, the Singapore government knew what this could do to their economies. They were terrified and they reacted appropriately and strongly and quickly. We in America and many countries around the world, Italy, Spain, had not your experience. And we didn't imagine what this would do to our economies. We know now what it can do. The cost is $8 trillion to the United States and growing. Mm -hmm. And the cost of the world may be another global depression from which China will suffer along with everybody else. There'll be no country that escapes a global depression. So I think that's a perspective that most people don't account for. The second thing has to do with viruses. Viruses should be thought of as machine intelligence. We know how AI works. It generates all sorts of random potential solutions and finds the one that fits. What viruses do is they throw up trillions and trillions of variants and they try to find chinks in the human armor. And they've been very successful. In my time, one of the chinks in the armor was polio. How did it work? Well, it was a cold virus that only struck and paralyzed one out of 200 people. So it had a free run. Nobody could figure out who gave it to whom. The second pandemic I've lived through is HIV. It had an eight year silent period by which it was transmitted. Now it took pretty intimate contact, blood exchange or sex to transmit it, but it got around and it's killed 50 million people. This virus has its own strategy. It is asymptomatic or presymptomatic for a long time before you get it and then it moves on to someone else. It's a hit and run, but it's got an asymptomatic period. So it's found chinks in our armor. It's found chinks in our social structure. It's found chinks in our political structure, as well as our biology. And if we look at this in a more distant mirror, or we look forward to the future, we have to realize that we humans have created a wonderful ecological niche for new viruses that attack us. Where many of us, seven and a half billion people, we live densely packed, we travel a hundred times more than we did 20 years ago. We have great social inequities. Just look at Singapore with what's happening right now with their migrant workers. Look at the ratio of black to white deaths in the United States. Look at around the world where this virus might be going 
Look at uncollected bodies in Guayaquil, Ecuador. It's exploiting and it's also exploiting political and social organization. China as a political organization, as Yang Xiao pointed out, which functions one way. America has a political and social organization which operates differently as does that of Italy and Germany and France and Spain. And it also exploits temporal differences in political leadership. It's what viruses do. And we have to be prepared for that. So there are a number of things to consider when we look not only at this epidemic, but when we look at other epidemics. I can tell you as an American, it is horrifying to me that our country with our resources are now experience the worst epidemic in the world. Now, I don't think that's gonna last long. I think we're gonna see worse epidemics in other areas. I can think of India, I can think of Sub-Saharan Africa, I can think of Brazil, where you have a leader who's denying it even is a problem. Even today, just firing his health minister. I think we're gonna see even bigger problems in America. Because once Americans understand something, we can and do have the ability to react. Unfortunately, our political system, as most people recognize, is broken at the moment, and the virus has taken advantage of that. Hopefully, we'll get it under control, and we'll be able to succeed. But we are having really serious difficulties. Living in New York, you hear sirens all the time. Friends of mine have died. There are morgues in the street. It's pretty grim. Uh, and it isn't the worst it could be, as we know from other epidemics. So let me talk about a problem China hasn't solved, and that is the mortality of those people who are seriously ill. Your mortality rate is maybe five times what ours is. I think that's something China has to pay attention to. Uh, if you look at the survival of intubated patients in our best hospitals, it's 90%. Your survival is closer to 10%. That's something to consider when you're looking at the overall comparative picture. That doesn't mean survival is 90% everywhere, but it means it's 90% some places. And we can and will learn how to do things better. And I think that's something we can teach the rest of the world. Not that we want to teach the rest of the world many things. Now, regardless of political organization, there are certain fundamentals in epidemic control that have to be done. Identification of who's infected through testing or other means. You don't necessarily have to test. You can find people who are sick. The asymptomatic problem will always be there. But if you do really extensive contact tracing around everybody who's sick, you'll find all the other people who are perhaps asymptomatic. So there are things that other countries can do, and India is trying. India is now trying that, a people-intensive push. Will they be successful? We'll see. But it is an alternative that other countries can try. The second thing is contact tracing. You've done it very well. Some countries do it better than others, and it's taking a long and painful lesson that we have not yet implemented in this country, which is rigorous contact tracing. It is absolutely necessary. You hear now every day our healthcare leaders talking about it. I don't think our political leaders yet quite understand what that really means and how important it is. And there's one thing we don't talk about. You talk about controlled quarantine, putting somebody in a hotel room, putting them in a hospital, getting them out of circulation. Nobody does controlled quarantine in the United States. We just don't do it. It is a deep flaw. And the result of that in Italy, Spain, and the United States is very likely to be, yeah, we can flatten the curve by social isolation, but it'll be a plateau that goes on for a very long time rather than a hump. People talk about squashing the curve. Well, we'll flatten the curve, 
We'll go up on it, what's called an escarpment, but we may not come down if we don't do real controlled quarantine. And those are words you do not hear in our discussion. And I would urge every country because the invisible part of the discussion is East Asia, United States, Europe, but what about the rest of the world? You and China know your neighbor, Russia, has a really big problem they're not admitting to. It is your problem because they're your neighbor. They're infecting you. 40 Chinese on one plane from Russia were infected. Well, what does that say about the rest of Russia that we don't hear about? What about other countries that we have no idea of because there's not testing? So what we see today is a problem. So the three fundamentals, identification, contact tracing, and quarantine are absolutely necessary, no matter what your political philosophy, no matter what your economic level. It's the virus that determines that, not human structure. We should think of the virus as we think of an earthquake. Nobody thinks of an earthquake as reflective of human social organization. Why should they think of a virus, a form of nature, any differently? But we do. We personalize it. And that is a fundamental mistake. So let me look forward. What is it that we can do? Is there something, I'm a biomedical scientist, is there something we can do? And there's a lot we can do. In the end, science will save us. I want everybody to understand that. Science will save us from this epidemic, whether it's soon or whether it is later. Science will save us. And how will they save us? Well, the first thing we are already implementing is treatments with immune serum. But we can do better. We can do hyperimmune serum, which is pooled serum, and we're beginning to do that. That will save some lives. But to me, even more importantly, or as importantly, it will save the life of healthcare workers. 20% of our cases are healthcare workers. 75% of those are women. I'll give you a number. Today it's 60,000 people. 60,000 healthcare workers in the United States are currently infected with SARS-2. That's a very large number. And it's only going to grow. Protective gear can only go so far. As one intubation person said, you're next to a nuclear reactor. What can you do? You can take whatever measure you want, but you're right next to the nuclear reactor and there are going to be infections. Yes, you can take some of the infections down to the fact we didn't have the right equipment, but there will be a high rate of infection no matter what we do. And so we've got to have a prophylactic way to do that. And I believe it'll be IgG, there are other approaches, even going back to horse serum, for Pete's sake, that we can use. So I think that'll be the first thing. The next thing, will, will that extend to the general public? Harder to imagine until we have a monoclonal antibody that can give temporary immunity or a drug that will give prophylactic immunity. And as we know, there are all of these clinical trials going on around the world. Now, some of them may work. The ones that I've seen, most of them aren't going to work. Chinese traditional medicine, forget it. Indian traditional medicine, forget it. Some of the things like chloroquine, not only forget it, but is dangerous. Remdesivir might work, but it's not a great drug. It's not specific to this virus. It didn't work for Ebola, maybe for special reasons. It might work a little bit, but we already know it's not a silver bullet. Can we find silver bullets for this? This is an easy problem. It's been solved. It's been solved for SARS. It's been solved for MERS. Why don't we have it? Because no government, not the Chinese government, not the Korean government, not the Singapore government, not the United States government, not the French, Italian, or anybody bothered to stockpile drugs that we knew would work. And lo and behold, 
the drugs that were developed in 2003, 2006, 2013 work against this virus as well as SARS and MERS because the inner part of this virus is conserved. They work at very low concentrations. Had we brought those drugs to fruition through clinical trials and stockpiled it, maybe 10 or 20 people needed to die in the world from this virus before it was stopped dead. That is a failure of monumental proportion by the scientific, biomedical, medical, and political community. It is a tremendous failure. We are now rushing to try to correct that failure. But let me tell you, as I look forward, I see equal threats from around the world. The viral world is out there to get us. The microbial world is out there to get us. We can see where they're coming from. And I hope that governments, your governments, our governments, governments around the world, take what me and many people like me have been saying ever since AIDS struck us, that we have to be prepared in advance. There is a terrorist loose in the world. That terrorist is called nature. It's a far more wily and dangerous terrorist than any human organization or human could ever be. It created us through machine intelligence like activity. It can certainly destroy us the same way. We must use our collective intelligence to look into the future, remember the past, and save ourselves. Science will save us. That's it. Thanks. Thank you, Bill, for the wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, thoughts and uh, deep analysis of what the current um, uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic is to us and to the human being and to the society and to the government. Uh, this is a very um, uh, a good lesson for us to have a reflection and also to think what should we do? What should we do as an individual, as a community, as organization, institution, as a government, as a country, and as the world? So this is a great conclusion for the first part of this webinar. And now we're going to go to the second part, uh, which will be moderated by Chuck Noon. Uh, to uh, uh, about uh, to to coordinate the uh, the roundtable discussion. So now I would turn the podium to Chuck. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Uh, hi everyone. My name is Chuck Eng. Uh, I'm actually calling in from the West Coast. Uh, I'm the head of the UC Berkeley uh, Chinese Alumni uh, Association. I'm also the founder of the Global Green Development Alliance, which we have a number of speakers, as well as uh, Humankind Now. So uh, as this is a joint effort between, as a nation, it's a really a you know, national effort, a nationwide effort, I'm very pleased. Thank you very much for Bill. Thank you very much, Yasheng. Thank you very much, Yuan Li from China. And of course, Jing, uh, for your great remarks uh, and insights. Thank you very much again. Uh, and now uh, let me kind of lead the discussions on the side of, on the West Coast side. Uh, we will be in the next, uh, I think uh, 15, 20 minutes, uh, we will have uh, three, you know, three and you know, four panelists. Uh, we will have, uh, you know, we'll start with our first panelist, which is uh, Xiao Feng Jiang. Xiao Feng is uh, you know, the president and founder of the Global Green Development Alliance. Uh, she will talk a little bit about how we from the West Coast side will support the efforts uh, in the East Coast side. So Xiao Feng, let me hand the time over uh, to have you start. Okay, Xiao Feng, Great, she's putting up. Uh, okay. Okay, great. Thanks. Sir. Global 
doing development alliance. So I'm happy to be here with the uh, talk about Corona-19 special webinar. So I just quickly review, you know, when, what we have done for the Corona-19 relief. So we are the partner of the Corona-19 Relief Bay Area. This is the 20 non-profit organization organized in San Francisco Bay Area. So we uh, get the donations and uh, buy the face masks and uh, also other PPEs. Uh, you can see the pictures. So, uh, you know, everybody are really busy to help the local hospitals and the doctors. And uh, you'll see our moderator, you know, Chuck Ni. He is the one in the do donate the face mask to the hospital. So we also organized the uh, webinars with the US China Health uh, Summit. Uh, so to date, you know, we already organized the three webinars. So the first one is uh, Professor Ma Jin, you know, she is uh, from the East Coast. So we also organized the other um, webinars. So most invite some doctors from the U.S. and China, and also you know Boston medical doctors, and for the also invite the psychologist who has worked in the Wuhan uh, for the Corona nineteen relief, and also local psychologist. So what we would do for next step? So if I can quickly summary, you know, one is we connect the information and the broadcast to mainstream media. For example, produce a documentation film to record our stories against the Corona-19 uh, and uh, among uh, American Chinese and the Chinese community, such as uh, we see a historical documentation movie. So become American, the Chinese experience. This film documented Chinese American stories from Im immigrate to success between 1814 to 2000. So additionally, we would like promote innovation research technology against the global uh, Corona-19 and, and uh, integrate clean energy and other smart technology to help economics recover. So this one we would like Jian Wu to drive more. So I just get other additional two minutes, talk about our organization. Global Green Development Alliance is the 501C3 nonprofit organization headquartered in San Francisco Bay Area. So we focus on global clean energy fighting climate change and the healthcare development. So we concentrate uh, some technology and also you know, build the platform for the dialogue. So strategy leadership, international conference and the leadership development. So global green development milestone so we come to United States, I think Jin Ma is our old friend about 30 years. So our leaders, you can see the Dr. Feng Peng, Feng Peng, you know, he is US China Friendship Summit Shanghai with the President Bush and also with the Vice President Ao Gao. And we also participate many international conference and uh, with the uh, Professor Stephen Chu, you know, that time he was the Secretary of the Energy and uh, we have uh, organized uh, several international, you know, Green U.S.-China Green Energy Summit. So with Professor Stephen Chu, Nobel Prize winner, and also professors from Stanford, uh, UC Berkeley and from China, Tsinghua University and so on. So we have a long history and we are also very lucky to have a partner with the US-China Health Summit. So we collaboration with the Stanford Energy Summit, Tsinghua University, 
and uh, also IEEE uh, and uh, UC Berkeley uh, Chinese Association and uh, our 20 regional actions. So our board director and the executive team, so Professor Peng, oh, Dr. Peng Fang and uh, Professor Yuan Li Liu are our co-chair and I'm um, the president and uh, Jin is uh, our secretary general and uh, Jian Wu is the executive director and Chuck Nei is the chief operation officers. So we have an outstanding team. Okay, thank you. So I will like the, our host continue to continue this discuss. Well, thank you very much. Um, and, uh, you know, for, uh, you know, Xiaofeng for the introduction. And now I would like to uh, introduce our next speaker, which is uh, Dr. Jane Wu. Uh, Dr. Jane Wu is also the founder of Grant Development. She's also uh, a the chairwoman for the UN's body on charity foundation. So Dr. Jane Wu, please. Hi, Chuck. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the wonderful story shared by U.S.-China uh, Health Summit. Uh, I just want to elaborate a little more about uh, what we are doing over here and some uh, uh, activities uh, uh, from our task force. Um, the team over here was really inspired uh, largely in part by the struggle that frontline fighters as well as the drug developers face every day, both financially and scientifically. So we started looking into the people around the world and also in the United States and here in, in our community uh, who really sacrifice themselves trying to help people to survive and make sure that the same pandemic will never come back again. So the team over here tried to put together a special report which investigate the Asian society in US uh, response to the coronavirus pandemic from both the west side and the east side of the Pacific Ocean. So the report will mainly focus uh, at the community that the people suffers the most from the high number cases and the fatality date which is uh, right over here in the East Coast and in China. So meanwhile, um, we are very lucky that we find uh, a professional team. We are uh, very honored to align with them and have them to support us to producing a documentary uh, film. The, the, the film itself, um, will uh, document all the efforts that we have been putting together so far as Asian society to support uh, the nation, the community, and the world to fight the disease. So the show uh, we are trying to making aim to explain uh, in terms of, uh, in the language of that, everyday viewers can understand uh, how and why the people from all communities should unite it to prevent and contain the disease outbreak. So the second task force is very interesting. Uh, is, uh, uh, we are uh, currently uh, uh, working together as a big team, is trying to uh, help the, the community to go back to business again. So we call it task force, so, to reopen the economy. So as, as we discussed you know, a very extensive uh, over here in Silicon Valley that there are five imminent te technologies that really require uh, to have as soon as possible. The first one is uh, tracking apps, just like Apple and uh, uh, Google's uh, join force together to develop. And uh, I think they will release very soon uh, and start a test run over here in Silicon Valley. And the second one is a temperature check. And the third one is 
blood testing, antibody blood testing. As we said, test, 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 right? So we talk about every day, but we need it uh, widely available to everybody who is returned back to work. And the fourth is cashless transaction. I think the technology itself is, is, is already mature, but we do need to enable everybody to use it. And the fifth is 3D printing on face masks and the shelves. The team over here are mainly uh, uh, put all the uh, resource together and integrated all the technology, uh, focus on the temperature check uh, development. Xiaofeng, you may show the picture that uh, the, the the robot, the picture that uh, 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 that uh, we shared uh, earlier uh, on your presentation. So, uh, uh, the, uh, I think I, I don't have the screen. So, uh, Xiaofeng, yeah, it's possible. Yeah. So, at a stage we so called the new normal. I think the temperature check could become part of our daily life. Monitoring individuals before entering office, schools, even uh, sport events, right, become essential and mandatory. Many factories um, and the public facilities are urging for acquiring such a walkthrough temperature scanners. Uh, Recently, I heard that some meat factories and also uh, hospitals uh, are, are, are fighting to get such equipment installed permanently in front of their facilities. Right? So by doing so, they can prevent people with fever from entering the facility. So as a Silicon Valley organization, the team here, uh, we have jointly uh, developed a very high throughput thermal temperature-based uh, checking robot. We temporarily name it as uh, Little Fauci. Uh, <laughs> uh, we may have a better name for it, but now we call the name for Fa Fauci. So uh, this robot has been developed with uh, integrated AI and the edge computing technologies. Uh, so it can scan about 30 people uh, simultaneously within one second. So when people coming in, uh, you don't wait five seconds per, per people, you will uh, generate the traffic uh, for doing such a work, right? And uh, also you can uh, uh, recognize the people's face. So you can track down uh, at a certain people, uh, his temperature today, yesterday, and uh, where he walk, where, where, where he will walk around and his walking hours. So you, you can understand that who is, the people who is the society that uh, stay in the same society, the same facility with that person. Right? So uh, this is the, the it's, it's a very smart robot we put together. Okay, uh, I partner with some major manufacturing technology partners here in Silicon Valley, and uh, and also we are forming a task force team who can work with uh, the. Um, uh, government officials to establish so-called PPP program, public-private programs, so uh, partnerships. And uh, we certainly welcome uh, our partners in, on the East Coast and all of the country to join us. I think of all we, when we all work together, we will able to uh, get back to our normal life and open the economy again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Jane Wu, uh, and thank you, thank you uh, Xiao Feng, for uh, highlighting some of the things that we could do, uh, and, and certainly the efforts from the West Coast side. Now, continue on on that effort, let me introduce um, you know, Megan Pai, who is the chairwoman and founder of the Humankind Now. She's also the vice president at Google. Uh, Megan, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Jane. Um, uh, that was uh, very inspiring that Jane is working on something that um, this country and the world have something to look forward to once everything's over. Um, so my name is Megan. I, I and uh, a group of about 15 people from Silicon Valley, we started an organization called Humankind Now. 
uh, the vision of uh, what we're doing is beyond uh, COVID, but in the next few months, maybe up to a year, our goal is to protect 10,000 health workers. It is uh, a grassroots effort, but uh, we are unique in a, in, a different, in a few different ways. The first uh, uh, and the foremost is that we have a very unique blend of people from Silicon Valley. We have entrepreneurs, we have engineers, we have people who can lead our large organizations, can inspire people. We have people who are um, very experienced uh, philanthropists. We have people who are physicians and, and doctors. And, um, and the second thing is that we are technologists. So we're building a platform, a digital platform, that will help uh, the 10,000 health workers that um, we want to help. And the last, uh, but and the lastly, um, what um, I think uh, the way uh, how we are different is uh, is that um, is that um, um, we move very fast. We're very committed to do this, and uh, we have it's all volunteer organization. All the donations goes into purchasing PPEs for people for health workers. And, and uh, we understand that um, doing something like this is not just about how passionate you are, wanting to help. It's also about uh, getting things done and executing. So we are just three weeks old. We have gotten a lot done. So I'll give you a few examples. So we have already shipped to about 500 um, health workers uh, were officially incorporated. We are uh, we have partnership with Google uh, on AdWords and uh, G Suite. We have a partnership with Flexport. We also have a partnership with uh, um, a very generous and, and a generous donor, local donor, who is happened to be the owner of a consumer B two C company who is doing shipping and fulfillment for us. And those are just a few examples. So. Um, we would love for you to help us to, to get our words out and so that um, the, the, in your community, within your network, your loved ones, your family members, friends and who are working in the front line, who needs help and we can help them. So that's number one. The second thing is uh, that we're in this together. This is a very amazing community of people and uh, we need uh, every single thing you can give us help of any type it takes uh, it's uh, my daughter uh, gave us uh, 15 dollars from her piggy bank that will get us three masks so there's no donation that's too small so and we ask all of you to consider um, giving us all the help you can give us and that's about it thank you chuck very good, Megan. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, right now it's uh, going into our Q&A sessions. Uh, I'm very conscious of people's time as well. So we'll keep it, uh, if the uh, panelists, if you can keep your answers short, because I think we have an, uh, quite a few uh, questions coming as well. So I, um, well, let me ask the you know, first question, which is, it's actually so wonderful to have uh, key leaders from both the East and the west coast of the US, as well as from China, of course. Um, I guess really kind of leveraging on everyone's collective wisdoms and expertise. Um, you know, why should we do, uh, actually, I think before that, I, I'm sorry, I apologize. I forget a really important, we always save the best. It's interesting to talk a little bit about uh, her perspective uh, before I ask my question. But Jing, please, actually I should, Jing, uh, who is the founder of U.S.-China Health Summit. Jane, please. Oh, okay. Uh, I would just quickly go, because I mean, uh, you know, all our friends uh, from the West Coast uh, have uh, discussed about or, or mentioned about uh, their efforts in fighting against the, the, the pandemic. And I just want to show you uh, some, um, uh, let me see, I can open the slide. Uh, yes. to, to quickly, very quickly to show what we have been doing uh, in, on, the wet, on the East Coast uh, based upon the U.S.-China House Summit. So we uh, quickly, after, right after the China, the outbreak of uh, coronavirus uh, uh, in Wuhan, 
because we're all Chinese. Uh, so as the as organization of US-China House Summit, we quickly organized um, uh, teams, volunteers, and uh, we addressed, uh, focused on the following areas, uh, on the reports, digest, analysis, and daily news. And also we uh, formed relief and aid groups, uh, mainly help, trying to help the, the uh, college students and uh, uh, grad students of Chinese uh, uh, among the universities in the United States. And also we have other uh, uh, activities, especially policy analysis and uh, so talk addressed to need media, <laughs> as well as the webinar and uh, the last but the, not the least one, uh, we, you know, this is the, the, the action to call for a global relief uh, 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 effort. So this is uh, the, the, the beginning of this uh, effort. And our team, uh, so far we have uh, mobilized uh, 70 uh, volunteers. Uh, most of them are in the public health area and uh, they're MDs, doc, uh, PhDs. And we have many senior advisors from both uh, this side of, uh, and also from China. And, uh, and the, all these people with diverse backgrounds. And so far we have uh, published uh, the uh, uh, daily uh, digest. We call it uh, the intellectual aid to the, uh, to, the, to, the, to the pandemic. And we have all these numbers you can read. We have many uh, reviews and, uh, and produce guidelines and public reports analysis. And this is the, just an example of the pictures of our, uh, among the, our reports. And this is our daily uh, 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 reports and digest. And we also have the daily news and the numbers. Uh, this is very well, all these are in Chinese and we, we, we send back through the WeChat public uh, platform and back to the to ch Chinese uh, audience and uh, got uh, uh, lots of um, uh, uh, views and, and, uh, and interest. And we also have, um, uh, yeah, these are the daily news and, uh, and numbers. And we also support the local communities as I mentioned. Uh, and we're now producing um, the, the uh, uh, handbook for the, for the uh, pandemic uh, relief. And we would call them handbook for, for, for survivors, uh, for students and local communities. Uh, and also we organize uh, uh, webinars and also uh, talk to media. Uh, many, many times, uh, uh, Yuan Li on the other side uh, of, uh, in China and uh, we here on, in the United States. So, uh, the bottom line is, um, as all um, uh, parties have mentioned, this is a collective effort, uh, in, including uh, the US-China House Summit, the uh, Global Green uh, Development uh, F, uh, Alliance, and uh, Humankind Now, and, and also the Governance Institute, uh, the four um, organizations uh, collectively organized this webinar. And uh, together we are going to address, you know, we're focusing on the three points, the three major tasks, as Mika mentioned about the PPE. Uh, this is heartbroken to, to see what had happened in Wuhan, uh, and especially what Bill have just mentioned about 60,000 uh, healthcare workers uh, infected in this country. So this is an unbelievable uh, uh, disaster. So, you, that's what we collectively would like to continue the effort to support that point. And the second one, as Jay mentioned, we're going to collectively um, uh, uh, mobilize the information exchange and also mainstream media uh, platform and uh, including documentary films. And finally, uh, you know, we, um, our organization are focusing on promoting the pandemic related innovation applied research. I'm so glad to see Jan mentioned about that and also technologies and policy uh, applied research. So uh, in short, this is again collective effort and we uh, together we can win the war against the virus. Thank you. <clears throat>
Very good. Thanks a lot, Jing. And that actually puts a great summary for that. Let me start the interactive session uh, of this, uh, you know, this uh, call now. Oh, I, I want to ask the first question to uh, Ya Shen, uh, Megan, and Bill, actually. Uh, my, fir my first question is, you know, uh, of course, it's great that we have key leaders from both East Coast and West Coast. Uh, all of you guys have collective wisdoms and a lot of expertise. Um, I guess the first question to Professor, uh, you know, to Yashen, uh, please tell us why we, th why we should do this uh, right now at this time. Uh, oh, well, I, I think there's obviously this is a public health emergency as a member of a community. We ought to, um, we ought to contribute toward uh, the effort uh, to deal with this public health emergency. But I'm also thinking about long-term implications of our own actions. And as I said in my uh, remarks, um, U.S.-China relations are, it, it was already severely challenged even before the coronavirus outbreak. There's every evidence that it is going to be um, going through another incredibly negative uh, phase of the relationship. Um, and, and this is the election year in the United States. And I know for a fact that there are um, American politicians, mostly from the Republican Party, who are going to use China as a excuse for the poor performance of the Trump administration. As I said before, Chinese uh, uh, lack of transparency, that's a legitimate topic, but I don't think that has anything to do with what is going on in the United States. And we as uh, members, Chinese American members of this society, whether you like it or not, are going to bear the burden of that relationship, uh, deterioration of the relationship between the two countries. We're going to be viewed by the rest of the society probably suspiciously, negatively. And, and so I would argue that uh, it is not because of uh, our actions that led to, definitely not because of our ethnicity, that led to the current situation. Um, it has nothing to do with that, right? The, 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 the political intention to say this is Chinese virus, this is a Wuhan virus, is extremely irresponsible. But we have to be realistic. There are going to be people in the country who are um, uh, who are going to uh, have that idea that this is uh, Chinese, deeply Chinese, um, and they're going to blame this on, on, on us. So I believe that we as m members of this community need to make our own contributions and we need to take our own position on this and, and we need to showcase. So there was an earlier uh, a presentation about the documentary and, and media uh, efforts, we need to showcase that we are productive, contributing members of this society. Many of us do research, and, and I do social science research, I do economic research, but others like Professor Ma uh, is doing medical research. Um, you know, this is, this is all very, very good, but we also need to do the things that are visible to the, uh, to the American society, to the mainstream uh, society. And we need to be involved in the PPE effort, in the ventilator, in donation, in fundraising. And this is the idea of, and also we need to do this as a common community. Whether you are in the West Coast or East Coast, we need to do this uh, together. So far the Chinese, um, uh, Chinese efforts have been mostly local, very, very local community 
that's great. There is America is built on local communities and local uh, society, but we need something bigger. We need something nationwide. We need something with higher visibility. And that's the idea that we have been uh, talking about uh, how to create this coalition of forces in the East Coast and the West Coast to, to do something visible and also uh, contributing toward the effort. Great, great. Bill? Uh, I don't have much to contribute to uh, uh, this particular uh, part of the uh, discussion. Um, the way I deal with questions that concern China, US, is why talk about China when the problem's here? It's just a distraction. But it will continue, I think, as Yasheng pointed out, to be a distraction. Uh, are you going to be able to diffuse that through your actions? No, not at all. You may even foster mistrust. People may think you're trying to hide or do something insidious. So you have to be prepared that your best intentions will be misread. Mm. Uh, that is a real possibility. So yes, you should do what you can for all communities, including the Chinese community, uh, but you should have realistic expectations in the greater scheme of things. Uh, whose megaphone is louder? Will actions make much difference? I don't think they will in this. They can't hurt. They can be misinterpreted. Um, so, as I say, I don't have a lot to contribute to this. I understand the human impulse to help. It's a good thing to do. Uh, but in this current climate where you even see the World Health Organization being attacked, mm -hmm. it sort of tips toward China, supposedly, what you're doing is a tiny drop in a big ocean that the waves will just swamp you. Mm -hmm. That's how I look at it. Keep it up. It's great work. It's something that everybody, the way I look at it is everybody should turn their hand to the task with the abilities that they have. If you have the ability to communicate, communicate. If you have the ability to analyze, analyze. If you have the ability to help find new drugs, you do that. If you have the ability to help get masks, to save healthcare workers, do that. That's a human responsibility in times of, of, of stress. And so that's how I would uh, present what you're doing. This is what we can do and it's why we're doing it. Not we're doing it to save China's image. You can't do that. Great, great. On that note of taking actions, Megan? Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. So, uh, I'm calling this from my backyard in California. It's hard to, you can, as you can see, uh, you know, it's a beautiful world and uh, in California, at least. And then I, I personally think that, uh, I mean, I, I can speak on my own for myself. Like, uh, I'm not doing this because I want people to feel, to know that uh, I'm not guilty of doing anything wrong in this. And I really am doing this and everybody doing this in our organization is really think that we, because of all your humans, like, uh, this is a fight against uh, uh, a virus and, and we should do our part. Uh, saving 10,000 people's uh, lives and potentially, it's actually extremely hard for a grassroots organization like ours. People said it was 10,000 people. We have so billions of people in this world. Um, I feel really, really passionate about uh, doing our part and we have done that already for 500 people. I, I think we're on a way to to achieve our goals i really believe that we're raising 2.5 million dollars and we're doing really well we are on the 10th day of raise fundraising and uh, between the goods we have been able to get donated donated and funds so we're at two hundred fifty thousand dollars on the 10th day it's a small team congratulations so i thank you i track you are part of this <laughs> so i i think I think this grassroots stuff is amazing. Like uh, I, I talk to so many other organizations like ours, and um, and with all of you, a lot of you on this call. And I think uh, through doing the stuff together, I think uh, we we can be better humans. 
coming out of this, and uh, I hope that we can do more together. I, 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 maybe it is a drop in the bucket and in the grand scheme of things, but if it makes all of us better people, why not? Well said. Actually, on on the note that we can all be better human beings. Obviously, to do this collectively, we need everybody's effort and everybody's help,、uh, which I think you guys all have all alluded to. So, what can our listeners and participants do to help、uh, this efforts that we are all trying to do? Megan, since you're on that already, please, you know. Yes, we need the, the two things I said. We need you to help us to get the words out, and we're in a weird spot at this moment. We have too many N95 masks. And we're trying to find health workers. It's very, this is a pendulum like a swing, and from week to week. So、uh, we're having trouble sometimes to find the real time information on who, which clinic, which people will need masks. And so、um, I would love for you guys to help us to get our words out. And I'm pretty sure we can send up a, a, a send out a follow up email to, so you know where to go.、And、the second thing is、uh, we need a donation. So, a dollar counts. Five dollars count. A thousand dollar also is welcome if you have more. And I would love to talk to you. Great. Thank you very much. So on that note, uh, also, uh, you know, uh, Jing, uh, Jing from Boston,、um, your comments on that? Okay. Yeah.、Um, uh, I mean, Megan、uh, made a very clear、uh, mess, send a very clear message about、uh, you know everybody can help, and I do. I think this pandemic really changed people's life, and also changed people's soul. You know, everybody should think about or have been thinking about what's the purpose of the your your life, your 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 money, and uh, and uh, and uh, human being, humankind, and and with that. Doing a little bit good means you are doing, you know, probably collectively doing a lot. This is what I have I have been always、uh, encouraging、uh, our volunteers. I told these young people, you are watching the history and you are also making the history, and this is how we really can mobilize young people, especially students, college students, graduate students. And they are so they work so hard to to watch, to write, and to do analysis, to produce all these uh, uh, products uh, that U.S. China House Summit has been doing, and they are so proud of that themselves. They are writing the history in 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 a certain uh, uh, level, and、um, and and we are extending this effort to to high schoolers now. Uh, not only graduate students、uh, and and others. So with all your support, your donation, your your involvement, even you know we have we have consultant, we have volunteers, uh, 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 experts, and also through the webinars, through this communication, we do we should collectively、um, uh, make this effort. The Chinese communities in the United States. Also, the Asian communities. The other day, I heard from the the the, the video, and all the Asian communities, Japanese, Korean, and others, are also affected. You know, we all look like. So, with that,、um, we sh- we we should voice our voice. You know, make our voice, and also we should、um, uh, show our humankind. And doing little, doing large. Whoever has the ability, whoever has the capacity,、um, this is what we. That's that's why we are calling this uh, 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 collective effort and alliance. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. You involved the UN.、Um, please comment on that. <clears throat> Go ahead, Jane.、Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes,、uh, yes, I'm part of the、uh, a foundation from UN uh, uh, NGO. Uh, it's very simple:、uh, United Nation, United People, United Organizations. By united together,、uh, 
I echo what Jean and uh, uh, making sure that we can become a better people. But I would love to say that we will also become stronger and safer at this moment. Thank you. Okay, very good. Um, because of limited time, I think I'm going to have like two questions. But I think the first question is uh, for Professor Yuan Li. Uh, Liu. Uh, Yuan Li, actually, you know, there's a, a question about the problem in the U.S. is COVID-19 patients are uh, oftentimes have mild symptoms or not allowed to be admitted in hospitals until they really get sick. Uh, so I guess the questions uh, which have, you know, more patients more severe with higher deaths rates in the U.S. and whatnot. Um, you know, the question is, you know, is there a reason why, you know, they, the, the questioner asks, I don't know why they have, they don't commit more sources to admit the mild cases in the U.S. Your, your answer to that? Oh, uh, this relates to the uh, issue raised by Bill earlier, uh, namely the controlled uh, isolation, you know, there are two reasons uh, for China uh, to do it uh, while the uh, U.S. chose not to do it. Uh, first is uh, uh, the housing condition. You know, if we let the, uh, uh, the in fact, force the confirmed cases or the test positive uh, patients uh, stay at home, and uh, most of the people live in very uh, crowded uh, flat, uh, conducive to uh, a spread of virus, unlike the uh, big houses uh, in the U.S. Of course, there are also uh, dense uh, populated flats, uh, apartments, uh, buildings in the United States. And uh, secondly, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, this is a, a country, uh, China, uh, that is uh, uh, nationally mobilized to fight a war. Okay, so uh, everything, uh, you know, the government uh, says, uh, mandates, and people would follow, and everybody knows that that uh, is not uh, business as usual. It's a, a war situation, so people are more, uh, uh, you know, uh, obedient, if you like, uh, uh, following the controlled, uh, the organization of controlled isolation. You know, uh, but uh, it's not a matter of simply a matter of uh, healthcare facilities. You know, we we know that uh, there has been a surging of healthcare. Uh, facilities uh, in New York City and others. Uh, I think it's also a matter of a culture whether you like to do it or not. Okay, very good. Thanks a lot. And then the last question is directed, I think, to well, I wanted to direct to Bill as well as uh, uh, yeah, Yanshan. Uh, it's you know, given the Wenport, that given the populism in both U.S. and China. How likely do you think that we will go into a new quote-unquote Cold War post-COVID-19? Uh, that Bill? is not, yeah. Um, I'm not going to comment on that. It's not my uh, area. I think everybody here can think of for themselves uh, what uh, that situation was. You're not old enough to remember what a Cold War was. <laughs> uh, it's not something that uh, we want to get back to. Uh, the economic structures are so fundamentally different from what they were post-war. Economies are linked uh, in, in numerous ways. Uh, you know, if you think about what happened when the, since 1989, when the barriers came down between China, America, uh, the Eastern Bloc, uh, the Cold War ended, we generated at least 10 to 20 times more money in the world. We want to go back to a time when there's 10 to 20 times less money in the world. We want to go back to those horrible times, which I remember, where we looked at people from other areas with suspicion. I don't think so, and I don't think we can. I don't think that's the way the world's headed. Yes, we're going to have tensions. Uh, there will be good leaders. There will be bad leaders in both countries. Um, I look at the world pretty soon is going to be tripolar. Mm -hmm. There'll be the United States, there'll be China as the two great powers, there'll be Europe as a secondary power, there'll be uh, the rest of the world combined, possibly India and some others as secondary powers. That's the world of our children and my grandchildren. That's what the world is going to be like. I hope it's a much better world than the one I grew up in as a kid, where 
we saw the world in the weekly readers as white, pink, and red. Uh, mm. And uh, that was not a good world. Uh, this world's a much better world, and let's hope we keep it. Thank you. Uh, Chuck, can I, ahead. Ahead. Yeah. can I add my set of uh, input into the discussion of what the alliance we are uh, uh, forming uh, can do? Sure. Uh, I think uh, we uh, come together uh, bringing to bear two roles. Uh, one, of course, is the role as a responsible citizen, and uh, I really applaud you loudly uh, what you have done, uh, very charitable uh, PPE and other uh, uh, efforts. But we also come to this uh, uh, bringing to bear our professional role. Mm -hmm. We are more or less scientists of different fields, or either biomedical fields, you know, a technology field, uh, or a social science field. And uh, uh, what uh, Bill just said uh, earlier really echoes uh, time again, science will save us. Mm -hmm. So I think we should really uh, use our role as scientists uh, very well here, uh, because the science of uh, COVID-19 is still evolving. So what this organization can do is foster more dialogues like this, open dialogues among the scientists you mm -hmm. know, to raise awareness and to find to uh, synergize the uh, comparative advantages of different uh, research organizations. And uh, finally, uh, this is also the, what Bill, I think, is very experienced in doing, is trying to see whether we can help develop a platform to foster win-win collaboration uh, among the scientists uh, uh, of the United States and China to speed up, for example, the R&D process of vaccines, mm -hmm. uh, where, for example, uh, we can uh, talk to the Gates Foundation, uh, we can talk to different uh, uh, funders and the research labs, instead of uh, competing with each other, mm -hmm. why not we you know, uh, 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 work together? And uh, it reminded me the catalyst uh, idea uh, advanced by Harvard University you know, to uh, foster uh, cross-discipline collaboration, catalysts at Harvard would compel the scientists of different fields who never worked together before to work on a grant uh, application, you know, and that's how you make the breakthroughs in the uh, uh, R&D field. And that breakthrough is urgently needed, you know, uh, for confronting this uh, pandemic, and for advancing science and for saving lives. Great, great. So, but before, yeah, yeah. Let me, okay, go ahead, Jane. Let, let me just uh, one, make one more point. And just reflecting that uh, the US-China House Summit is currently talking to the Harkness Fellow, uh, which has been funded by the Commonwealth Fund, uh, Foundation. And uh, these hundreds of these fellows went back to Europe. Uh, they are in the medical fields, public health fields, and we're talking to them now uh, to trying to make the link between China, US, and the Europe uh, Great. in this effort. Yeah. Great. Before Yasun answers the last question, I want all of you guys to get ready for a one sentence in closing, a line that you want to share with the audience. So, um, so please, everybody, start thinking now, about I'm that. Give my but, uh, I'm going to give my sentence now because it's time for me to go to bed. Right. Okay. Is, I've already said it, science will save us. I want to thank everybody well for a very nice evening. And I'm going to say nighty night. Good, good night. Thank you, Bill. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's uh, Xiaofeng. So my sentence is uh, United We Can. So my major is uh, electric power. Uh, electricity, light sound is a basic supply for against the coronavirus. Without electricity, we cannot do the webinars, we cannot do anything. So this is our co-workers is work together and the way is medical, you know, in higher care, you know, we can uh, win the war, yeah. Great. That's the smartest commercial I ever heard. <laughs> 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 Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll go back to your original question about the Cold War. Um, 
it is uh, many people don't know this uh, or maybe don't remember this. Even at the height of the Cold War, Soviet scientists and American scientists collaborated on smallpox project. Right? Mm. So this is really remarkable, right? The two countries were threatening each other with nuclear weapons, and even that did not prevent some collaboration between the scientists from the two countries. And as bad as it is, the relationship between China and the United States, it is not reaching the level of the Cold War. So I agree with you, Andy, I agree with Bill and, and others. Science can save us, but science can save us through collaborations. No country can do this alone. So it's very, very important to emphasize the value of collaboration that that is going to be beneficial both to China and to the United States. The second point I want to make is that there's another difference between the Cold War and the current situation. We have far more collaborations, exchanges beyond the government sector, beyond the government channels. Yuan Li and, and Professor Ma, I have many, many collaborations in China with Tsinghua University, with Fudan University. Academic to academic collaboration, company to company collaboration, a student to student exchanges, uh, 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 artists and, and all of that. There's nothing like that between Soviet Union and the United States during the Cold War. So I don't think we are going back to that era as bad as the relationship is. The, the fact that we're doing this, right? Earlier you asked the question, why should we be doing this? I agree with Megan, we do this because we're human beings, right? Not because we feel guilty about something that has nothing to do with our ethnicity. But there is a special obligation on our part. And the reason is very simple. China produces a lot of PPEs. China produces a lot of ventilators. So we actually have special access to the suppliers in China. We have the knowledge to match the suppliers in China with the demand side, right? To use an economic term, matching supply with demand. We can do that probably more able as compared with a, 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 a random uh, a person on the street. Uh, at MIT, we are now working with Chinese suppliers now, and much of that work is done by people like me who know the cultures of both countries, who know the both languages, who have uh, connections in China. So in that sense, we as a community do have a special uh, role to play more than what other people can can play, so we should we should we should value that uh, responsibility, and we should do it in a way that will also be beneficial to uh, to uh, to the larger community. Thank you. Well, and what's your one sentence closing you want to say? <clears throat> well, I, I want to go back to the theme of our conference, right? United we can we can win, and uh, Chinese sometimes. You know, we have a history of fighting with each other and, and all of that. I think it will be really nice that we can collaborate uh, between East Coast and West Coast. We can collaborate between academics and companies, between NGOs and, 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 and different kinds of organizations. And we want to showcase that we are able to have transparency. We are able to have integrity in the way that we do things uh, to showcase that, that, that we value these uh, best practices uh, that, that I personally believe to be, uh, to be very, very important. That will be my multiple sentence uh, end, <laughs> uh, ending. Thank you. Well said. And, and thank you. Yuani, what's your one, uh, one line, one sentence on that? In order for uh, science to save us, and uh, we need to start by uh, organizing uh, informative and open 
dialogue and conversations among the opinion leaders. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Ching? Hold hands. You think about two big competitors. They can hold hands, Apple and Google. We all can hold hands. Then we will survive and we will win. Okay, very good. Jane from Boston, thank you. Um, through our volunteer work, I realized uh, the feature is young belongs to young people. And, and this, is a, this is a historical moment. And this is the pandemic uh, over a uh, hundred years. So um, we, as uh, uh, this generation, and I do hope young people could mobilize, could uh, really take actions to uh, make this world a better wor world, a more united, especially in the public health and uh, human uh, kind relief in the medical fields. Again, the hope uh, in the young people. Great. And we should work with them. Great. Xiaofeng, thank you. Xiaofeng. <laughs> Go ahead, Xiaofeng. We can, we can. Uh, yeah, so, so I would like to say the clean energy and the climate change action will be help and uh, against the uh, coronavirus relief and uh, we can make the earth better and the humankind can be better environment. Great. Well, thank you once again. I want to say in closing, I want to say thank you to all our wonderful speakers. Yuan Li from Beijing, Yasun from Boston, Jane from Boston, Bill from New York City, uh, Megan, Jane, as well as Xiaofeng from Silicon Valley West Coast. With that said, uh, I think we have this, um, you know, like the public uh, uh, QR code. So for those who are interested in joining our efforts, please scan it. Uh, and with that said, thank you very much and good night. And, and just thank to you, add Chuck. on, and yes, just go ahead. On, we have two uh, uh, wonderful websites, Humankind Now, and also the US-China Health Summit, no, no, no space, uschinahealthsummit.org. So please go on to our website. Uh, we will put all our information, including this uh, webinar uh, recording.